All right, let's get started. Welcome to Spine Conference. Today's discussion will be thoracic disc herniations. And do you know what that picture is, um, Rachel? I don't think so. That's St. Agnes when I first started here. That's what it looked like. Seriously, I took that picture. <laughs> I used to throw baseballs in the field there. Okay, do you want to present the case? Um, sure. Uh, we have a 61-year-old gentleman who complains of low back pain with left grip and right lower extremity weakness and numbness. He's been unable to ambulate, ambulate using a revolving blocker. He's got a history of an L3 through L5 posterior spinous fusion in 2008 and a C4 through C7 ACDF in 2012. He also has an opioid dependency since he was 13 years old. No, for 13 years. For the past 13 years. Yeah. Um, he currently takes oxycodone 15 milligrams five times a day, aspirin and inhaler. He presented to the emergency department 10 days after a left knee arthroscopy um, in September of 2022. He's been a disabled laborer since 2009. And on exam, he has diffuse pain in his lower extremities and diffuse weakness. He also presented to the ER earlier in the year in June, at which time he had some x-rays performed. Okay. Okay. So good. So basically 61 year old man with um, severe low back pain and left lower extremity weakness where he could just, he could just barely walk. So as far as the oxycodone dosage, um, like Rachel, you know, oxycodones are right. Yeah. What do you guess? How many, if you took a, a pill, a, if you've never eaten an oxycodone ever in your life and you took a big box of them, how many do you think would take for them to kill you? How many milligrams? For, to kill, like a 50% chance to kill you. Just, know, this guy takes this guy takes 15 milligrams five times a day. So he yeah, takes a total of 75. So just give a guess. Like if you took, if you had a bottle, I looked it up because I was curious to kill half the people. It's called lethal dose 50. It's LD50. Well, they do this in, pharmaceut in pharmacy. So that it, for every drug, they know what the lethal dose is that will kill 50% of the population if they're naive. Obviously, if you've taken oxycodone before in the past, you have a tolerance. That's why this guy's walking around. But for a night, just give a guess. 30. 80. So if you so if you're a naive person and you eat 80 milligrams of oxycodone, there's a 50% chance you will die. So my point is um, um, this patient has developed an incredible tolerance uh, to uh, oxycodone. And it, happen it happens over years. And it, it definitely changes everything. So, um, and it changes, it, like it changes, it's, it's hard to predict how it changes too. It's interesting. Can you guys guess like what, what it does to people over time? Is any guess? Often it, it makes you more sensitive to pain. Yeah, exactly. It makes you hypersensitive. And, and, and the term is like opioid induced hyperalgesia. So they, they did a study with a hydrocodone, I believe, and a, and a blood pressure cuff. And they just checked people, their tolerance to pain and the patients who are like only like on a week of hydrocodone could not tolerate the blood pressure cuff like they did before they took the oxycodone. So it, it makes people hypersensitive. That's why patients going in for surgery on opiates usually have more pain and don't do as well as patients who do not take opiates before surgery. It's kind of interesting. Harder to then manage their post-op as well. Yeah, it's harder to manage post-op repair. And also, um, uh, okay, so, so it makes them hypersensitive. And on the other side, good morning, everybody. Bye. Um, and on the other, on the other hand, sometimes it can make also patients dull the pain, like they, they have fractures and they don't realize it. So, um, it both can happen. So it, it really changes everything. Okay. So this is, um, guys, if, uh, just to catch up a 61 year old man with low back pain, uh, left lower extremity weakness. He just had a, um, knee arthroscopy. Um, and, um, he, uh, uh has, uh, weakness in his, uh, left knee. So, um, you guys think I would like, okay, so there's just two things before I go is I, I record these and I post these on YouTube. So keep everything E for everyone. And, and the other thing about the internet is, um, it's like I tell my, we used to tell my kids. Now they tell me everything's permanent and, um, permanent. And what's the other one? Permanent. And, um, I forget, but it, it, you, whatever you say, it should be able, you should be able to, you should be able to say this in front of your grandmother or your children or 
you know, uh, a classroom of um, <coughs> your peers. So who wants to who who wants to say what they see on the X-ray? Somebody other than me. Somebody, Ruth. Oh, there's some hard work. Yeah. So it's an AP and a lateral of the lumbar. lumbar spine. And do you think it's deformed or not in general? The spine. Yeah. Mildly. Yeah, not really. It's kind of normal, mm -hmm. and um, on AP and lateral views. And there's um, there's implants which you don't know what they are because uh, they're not commonly used. They're called posterior spinous process plates. Mm -hmm. And um, on the left, you can see what it does. It grabs the posterior spinous process. It's kind of like a clamp, and it holds things still to fuse it. So the typical instrumentation we use in the lumbar spine are pedicle screws. That's kind of like the tried and true. These are sort of new uh, instrumentation that. Um, so the whole point of the implants is to keep everything still so the bones fuse. So it doesn't matter how you use, if you use pedicle screws, if you use posterior sinus processes, whatever, whatever you use, it's just got to hold things still until it fuses together. Once the spine fuses, then you don't need the implants. You can take them out, right? Mm -hmm. So this is just one way to do it. How I mean, do you decide which, or you didn't decide this? I didn't do this surgery. This was done, uh, this was done in uh, 2008 okay. at another hospital. Okay. Um, um, how do you decide which ones to use? Um, I mean, first of all, you have to know how to do it. So it's something you're familiar with. Um, uh, some cases are difficult or easier than others. So most likely the surgeon felt there's not much of a deformity. There was not a decompression. So it was just, a, these are just very simple and easy to put on. So they probably had something to do with it. Mm -hmm. Where does the bony bridge then grow? Yeah, so in this case... Um, you would place bone in the, if you do not decompress, if you, de if you do a laminectomy, it's different because there's no lamina. Mm -hmm. But if, if, if you do not decompress, you just put it over the lamina. You put the bone right over the lamina, you put the bone in the facets, and you put it in the transverse processes like we usually do. Mm -hmm. So that whole area is a big fusion area. But you could also put in the posterior lateral gutter <laughs> if you do a, well, if you do a laminectomy, you can't use this, obviously. Okay. What other questions about posterior? Posterior spinous process plates, anything? So he had a, a fusion L304, L405. Now, this patient went to the emergency room three months prior to presentation to me. It was another hospital. It was one of the, one of the university hospitals. And, and the doctor there was concerned because he had low back pain, but also his post void residual was 200 cc's. So does everybody know what that is? Anybody, can anybody explain what that is? That's what's in the bladder. Yeah. After he's yeah, so you have the patient urinate, mm -hmm. and then you use the bladder scan. What should it be after you urinate? A normal person, like let's say a normal uh, young person, if they urinate, how much how much urine is left in the bladder? Under hundred. Yes, it should be. It should be. Yeah, usually I think it's like fifty. 50. Well, let's ask another question. How big does the bladder get before you have to pee in general? Does anybody know? You mean how many cc's? Yeah. I think it's like 400. I think, it, yeah, around that. It's, it's, I mean, obviously, there's ranges. Mm -hmm. So do you remember the other day we had that woman and and the and we put in the, black, the fully catheter? Remember how much came out? She had like 600 in Yeah, right away. Yeah. And so that patient, I was like, this is a neurogenic bladder. And you have men. What's a, Have you guys ever seen like a man, an elderly man that has uh, prostate hyperplasia? How much fluid comes out when they we put the Foley's in? You guys, what, what's the record? I mean, you guys ever pay attention? Probably seen a liter yeah, a whole liter, right? I mean, that's big. Yeah. That's like that's like a. You can imagine how huge and stretched that is. Mm -hmm. So, so the bladder has this capacity now. So, typically, let's say if a bladder squeezes down to fifty, why does this person's why does this patient's bladder not squeeze down? There's probably two reasons I could think of. Why? Well, I mean, we said about men, right? What a men. Problems prostate. of men, prostate hyperplasia, right? So they they can't the urine doesn't come out, so they very frequently have these large bladders because they're obstructed. But what about in the spine patient? If the what message isn't going to the urethra to relax, to let the urine flow? Yeah, the whole system falls apart if there's a neurological injury. So typically, uh, the nerve roots that go to the bladder are the sacral nerve roots two, three, and four. And if you have a huge disc herniation in the spine, you compress those nerve roots, you can lose your bowel and bladder control. And typically the numbness, you get numbness as well. It's called saddle anesthesia. Mm -hmm. If you jumped on a saddle that has paint on it, and then you looked where the paint is on your body, that's where the patients get numb. 
and, and they lose their bowel and bladder control. But also you can get you can get bladder incontinence from a spinal cord lesion in the cervical spine or the thoracic spine as well. And it can be subtle and it doesn't have to go by the rules. It can be unusual. So the uh, the doctor here was concerned. Maybe this guy, patient has a spinal cord injury because his post residual was high. And um, who wants to take a crack at the MRI? What do the findings of the MRI? Anybody? Well, I'll say here on the sagittal cut, I mean, it's kind of normal. They're all lined up. It looks normal. The spinal canal looks good. On the axial cuts, this is the spinal canal normally. Can you guys see the nerve roots there? Yeah. Yeah. And then three, L3, L4 is not bad. Mm -hmm. And I mean, what's that? L203 is a bit stenotic, but not terrible. Right. I mean, so you can make out individual nerve roots um, and uh, you do see some CSF. So it's, I don't think that's severe. But, and just so you get an idea, they sent him home after this MRI, the lumbar spine. So this was three months before. And this is just a, a cartoon, uh, explain, just, just so you can see pictorially how, how the bladder is. I mean, basically it squeezes down. So if it doesn't squeeze down, there's a problem somewhere. So th this patient, uh, you know, was moving his leg. Uh, and I said to him, you know, something's wrong with you. I, I don't know what it is, but you need an MRI. Uh, of your neck. I mean, I saw that he had a lumbar MRI. I was like, you need an MRI of your neck and your thoracic spine because something's not right. But he said, I, I don't want to go to the ER because he was his insurance would not cover it unless you do like six weeks of physical therapy. I was like, you have to go to the ER. There's no other way we're going to get this MRI scan. He said, I'm not going to the ER because I don't want to wait. I was like, that's fine. But then, so he did go to the ER and the ER called me and I said, I said to the ER, get an MRI of his cervical spine and his thoracic spine. The ER doctor did an MRI of his cervical spine and his lumbar spine. Do you, do you know why th there was a mistake? Can anybody guess why they didn't do what I said? How, how many thoracic MRIs have you guys seen? Rare, right? So I think the doctor just figured I made a mistake. Um, so they did an MRI of the lumbar spine and it was the same thing. It looked okay. It's so the same, same thing again, L1, L2, spinal canal, 3, 4, 2, 3 is not too bad, 4, 5 is a bit stenotic, 5, 1 is normal, see the spinal canal. And, and, I, and here's an x-ray of his neck. What do you guys see on the x-ray of the neck, somebody? The anterior Yeah, an anterior cervical plate and screws from C4 to C7. It looks pretty good. There's a bit of a spur here at C3, C4. You see that? Mm -hmm. And then... What do, you, what do you see on the MRI scan? Who can tell me what this ribbon is? What's that? Yeah, spinal cord. Yeah. And then what's, is this good? Having something compress your spinal cord? No, right? So at C3, C4, which is the next level up, there's a disc herniation compressing the spinal cord. And it's, it's pretty significant, right? It looks like it's deforming the spinal cord. So these are axial cuts. And I want um, somebody to describe the spinal cord at every level. So the spinal cord is the shape of a cylinder, like say a hot dog. And if you slice a hot dog, when you slice it for a child and then you put it on a plate, it's like a circle. Anybody have children that do oh, that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The kid, kids are so painful. Uh, so, um, so there's a little circle, right? So describe, somebody describe this shape. That's a spinal cord, axial cut. That's at C2, C3. Somebody describe it for me. What does it look like? Well, yeah, like a jelly bean, like an ellipse. Okay. So that's a, how about at, um, this is, this is uh, at the level of the fusion. Very similar, right? Mm -hmm. Plenty of cerebral spinal fluid around it. This is at C3, C4. Now, how would you describe this shape? Yeah, it's compressed, right? Definitely flat. And, and as a result of this pressure uh, from the front, anteriorly the disc, it's assuming more of a, of, of a much more of a flat shape, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, could, if you could measure the spinal cord distance from here to here, it's kind of like a block. You see that? And then if you could measure the distance of spinal cord from here to here. Oh, sorry, guys. From here to here in the medial lateral, there's like four. So it's kind of the spinal cord has like a four to one ratio. You see that? That's not normal. Um, there, there was an article. If it gets to one in five, uh, it causes direct ischemia and mechanical trauma to the spinal cord. So you see how if the... Yeah, it's, there's pressure on it. So it obviously changes and it gets flat. Mm -hmm. And th that's, that's how the deformity happens because usually it's disc protrusion anteriorly. So they found one in five is basically where 
patients start have serious problems with spinal cord. Now, my 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 point is, uh, do you want to wait on every patient to get down to one to five? I mean, for me, it's like saying, you know, it's for me like saying it's like it's you know the guy on the cliff is like it's only dangerous until you get like really six inches to get to the cliff. I mean, that was your sign, like you know, don't go that far. I mean, and you also have you see what I mean. So I don't feel that we should wait until it gets that severe to recommend an operation because if the spinal cord is injured, it, it can be permanent and cause a serious problem. So, um, he's already having symptoms that yes, wrong, right? yeah. Well, this patient's complicated. Okay. okay. But you're right. Yes. He is having symptoms. So that's key. Yeah. So the other thing is the other interesting question that we always have at every spine conference is what do you do with a patient that has severe spinal cord compression and absolutely no symptoms? Mm -hmm. That's always, we always talk about that. And I mean, um, some, some surgeons just do the surgery. Other surgeons just watch them. Most people watch them. And the question is how often do you watch them? Just, and you talk to the patient say, look, when you start getting these problems, you got to tell us right away because it can be serious. Okay. So this patient has, yes, very, yes, very, yes. I mean, it can, it can, like you can fall on your head and have a quick, uh, abrupt problem. But it is. It's very, very slow, and people don't understand it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and quite frequently, people say, "I thought I was just getting old, just like everything else." As you get older, you kind of lose function, um, so they don't notice it exactly. But if you tell them, they notice it. Say buttons. Um, most patients say buttons. They drop objects like cups because when you drop a cup, it's very you know scary. Mm -hmm. When you can't button things, when you when you can't uh, sew, people say, "I can't sew." When it gets really bad, you can't do handwriting. The other thing is, this is these are symptoms of myelopathy. Others, can anybody ask? Can anybody else tell me what other myelopathic signs there are? I can keep going, but hmm? so other myelopathic signs are um, imbalance. So people say my legs are drunk, like I can't walk well. I'm stumbling. I'm falling. And then when people fall, I say, how many times have you fallen recently? They're like, I fall once a week. And that's a big problem. You know, if dad's falling once a week, he's going to break his wrist or his hip or something like that. So um, those, are, those are the myelopathic signs or symptoms. Okay, so this person has spinal cord compression. He's four to one. And uh, I just want to go over a couple of uh, reflexes. So there's, there's signs and symptoms, right? So signs are something that you elicit. Symptoms are what they tell you. We talked about symptoms. Here's some signs. Inverted radi inverted. Uh, supinator ref uh, reflex is when you tap the brachioradialis, the wrist goes in the opposite way. It should go up and uh, it goes down and patients are myelopathic because they have a release of their uh, reflexes because they have pressure on the spinal cord. Um, this is just, I don't know if I should get into this, but this is just an article from 1963, which is a classic article of cervical stenosis. And patients get like the big black bar of symptoms Patient gets symptoms of cervical myelopathy, and then it goes away, and then they get more symptoms for like a year or two, and then it goes away, but it kind of always comes back. Like, so typically the spinal canal uh, has a has a large area for the spinal cord, uh, and there should be plenty of room like here. Um, the typical size is 14 to 17 millimeters, and the spinal cord itself is around 10 millimeters. So here's some more signs, finger escape sign. You have the patient straighten the hand out all the way in the fifth and fourth fingers, uh, flex. Uh, grip and release sign or dis diatocokinesia. Have them open and close their hand real fast. They can't do it. A Hoffman sign, I'm gonna show you that in a second. We talked in vertical radial reflex. So this is a, this is a real patient of mine. This is a case um, see here. It, she had severe cervical stenosis. He says severe spinal examination on the right side. The radial reflex uh, was normal. Normal. Hoffman's and Hoffman's testing of the DIP middle finger was negative. On the left side, the patient has a had a dramatic Hoffman sign, so you can see it. I usually use the third finger, so the third finger flex the thumb index middle finger and ring finger. Ring finger did not do anything. The index finger fired the thumb index and middle finger as well. The thumb had no reaction. I just thought this was interesting. You can see how dramatic the Hoffman's testing was on the left. She also had an inverted radial reflex. You can see here by tapping on the radialis, 
she had flexion of her digits and wrist. So that's Hoffman's. So um, any questions so far? I like the pause. So the Hoffman's, it should bounce back. When be people have spinal cord compression, mm -hmm. their thumb and index finger flex when you when you do that to the uh, okay. when you when you hold the finger and you flex. So in the normal test, there should have been nothing, nothing. Nothing. Nothing on the other finger. Nothing. Okay. If you did it, if you did it to Rachel, there's no response. Do you want me to show you on Rachel? Here, give me a hand. You take the middle finger and you go like that. See no response. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so the patient, so I had him scheduled for the next week for an ACDF because, uh, and the patient asked uh, the PA on the floor, why is Dr. Antonitis doing surgery on my neck when it's my leg that's the problem? And I was like, I mean, there's a really small chance it could be a thoracic problem, but let's just get the MRI to be sure because it's very rare, right? Thoracic discriminations are rare. So we got a thoracic MRI, and what do you guys see on the? Somebody say, what are the? What did the findings on the thoracic MRI? A T10, T11. There's something compressing the spinal cord, right? And the, yeah, T10. Yeah, exactly. T10, T11 does have a lot of loss of disc height, so it's an arthritic level. So it's protruding posteriorly, and also there may be some posterior ligamentum flavum hypertrophy. See this in the back side of the spinal cord? I, I wasn't sure what was going on, but there was definitely a problem there. So here are the axial cuts. This is the spinal cord in the thoracic spine. In the thoracic spine, it's it's more like a circle, not like a football, but more like a circle. And here's above T10 and T11 below, and here's at T10 and T11. What's going on? You can't see the spinal cord. Something's compressing it, right? So this here is where the, this here is, I believe, is the spinal cord, and there's something here on the left severely compressing it. Uh, I thought this was hypertrophic uh, ligamentum flavum or facet capsule. I wasn't sure what it was, but it's left-sided. So I think that's the problem. So we have a 61 year old man now. Uh, he has left low extremity weakness. He cannot walk. He has severe pain. He has the opiate dependency. He has severe cervical stenosis at C3, C4. He has no neck pain, no arm pain. He has moderate stenosis at L2, L3, and he has severe T10, T11 stenosis on the left. So which, which one should we treat first? Should we treat the cervical spine? Should we do both? Should we do thoracic spine? Anybody have any opinions? Not so. Yeah, it's not symptomatic. That was my thought. Okay, so let's let's keep going. So this is the um, this is the article I sent to everybody. I know nobody read it. But um, basically all, all disc herniations, disc herniations are common in a million people. So let's say there's a million people in Baltimore County. 450 people will get a disc uh, herniation that's symptomatic in Baltimore County this year, but just one in a million in Baltimore County thoracic. So it's much, much, much less. Um, and three quarters of them are in the lower segments because that's where all the motion is below T7. And some of them are soft and some of them are hard. They're calcified. Um, I'm not going to get into the this. This is a vasculature to the spinal cord. I'm not going to get into it. Okay. So the other thing is during the surgery, how do you know you're at T10, T11? Because don't they all look the same? Right? So like they all look the same, right? So how do you know where you are in the surgery? X-ray. Yeah. But the X-ray, you can only see three at a time. So how are you going to know? Just start somewhere that you're sure and work your way. Up. Yeah. You can get, you can guess, right? Um, I think it's here. But that's not good, right? Because if you're at the wrong level, big problem. You could also get an x-ray and, and you could just go by the fact that that disc is flat. But there's some risk involved with that too. You may be wrong. So I, I call this the leapfrog technique. I don't know if I, I don't know if I made this up myself or somebody tell me. I have no idea because I'm at the point in my life where I don't I don't know. I don't remember things. Huh? Yeah, it's leapfrog. I don't, I don't know how I learned this, but... I remember leapfrogging as a kid. One, you jump over the other person, you stop, the other person jumps over you, right? Leapfrog. So what's critical in the leapfrog technique is you need to get a scout image that shows the lesion and also the sacrum. Because in the operating room, you cannot go from C2 down because at, at C7, T1, T2, T3, you can't see those bones because of the, the shoulders. So you cannot, the fluoro cannot do that. But if you see the sacrum, you can easily count up. And the sacrum is really easy. Remember, uh, 
yesterday we you saw the sacrum and you, you knew exactly where you were because it has a triangular shape right so that's what's um that's what's nice about that so what i did is i told the radiology department we need a scout image of the whole spine and they do this all the time it's called spinal cord compression spinal cord compression study so they can do the whole spine just to see if there's something seriously wrong and that way you know the level and then here's a leap park now you can't see all the bones in the x-ray in the OR. that's all you see so the technique is you, you get this view where you can see the sacrum because it's a triangle and you put a needle and see in l3 then you move the fluoro up and you put a second needle at l1 and then you move the the needle from l3 up another two levels and then you get t11 so this way you're sure where you are and you count up like moving the needles like a leapfrog technique but you're sure of it now other ways you can do it is you can have radiology stick a um only reason i showed this because in that article they didn't describe that and i was like i thought everybody did. how do other people do it they have the radiology department put metal markers and things which is difficult you know because yet it's a procedure for the patient and you need a radiologist who's willing to do it okay here's another and i'm going to go real quickly over this this is another thoracic case which is interesting uh i won't spend too much time it was a 72 year old woman who had a fracture at t12 real common right she was treating a brace, but she could not walk because of weakness and she kept falling. And so what happened is in this lady is every time she stood up, this got worse. It, it, it collapsed and it was compressing her um, fecal sac. You can see here the bone encompasses uh, about 40 percent of the spinal canal. But I'm sure when she stood, it got worse. Um, oh, I, didn't, I didn't put. Oh, and you can see here on the MRI, it's compressing her conus. So she just she just could not walk. And uh, it was a problem. And, and we gave her two months and it just wasn't working. So what are the different ways you can um, decompress the thoracic spine? There's three ways, basically. There's the standard way, which is anterior. It's a big operation for the patient. You have to remove a rib. You get down to the spine. You have to push the lung. You have to collapse the lung with, a, with two uh, tubes in, in both lungs. And one of them closes off. So the lung's out of your way. You pack the lung. And the patients very frequently get out of like this pneumonia. And then uh, you have to... Um, Mobilize the segmental vessels off the either the aorta or vena cava. I don't know why they did this view, but usually you do a left side approach because the aorta is stronger than the IVC. You remove the you remove the uh, vertebral body and uh, then you decompress the spinal cord directly, looking at it. And then there's a hole. You have to fix the defect with something. You can use a cage. You can use dead person bone, uh, allograft, plate and screws. That's the direct approach. There's also with the with the creation of pedicle screws down the thoracic spine, we can do this through all through a posterior approach. I can't remember the last time I did a thoracotomy. Um, so we can decompress it by removing rib from posterior approach and then instrument the spine. And they're either called posterior lateral costo transversectomy. I usually call them costo transversectomy because that's what we do. We remove the transverse process, the pedicle and the rib costo trans. Or you could do a lat lateral extra cavitary approach. That's kind of a new term. The difference is just the angle, basically. You can see the angle difference. So you remove the rib, you remove the uh, pedicle, and you can decompress the spinal cord from a posterior approach. And you can only see so much. I mean, this is basically what you can see. You can't see here. So you do, you indirectly decompress this, like, you know, how we do in the OR. In the, in the, we, you, you take a, um, a curette or like a Woodson, you push down off the spinal cord, and then you retrieve it through your hole. And, uh, and then once you decompress it, you can reconstruct, you cut the nerve because the thoracic nerves don't have any motor and very little sensitive. You can cut that nerve so you can stick a cage in the front. So this is a case I did in 2016. Um, these are my notes. Uh, and I use this expandable cage, which is, it's better than the allograft because uh, it expands and gives you immediate fixation. It doesn't shift. And this is what it looked like post-op. So I removed that whole thing from a, um, costal transversectomy approach uh, and I inserted the cage and uh, I know it doesn't look perfect I mean I'm sure you guys are looking at it so it's a little crooked but what's critical huh? <laughs> what's critical in these cases is that you move fast so because um, uh, time in the OR is a problem for the patient and, and it was just me and a PA if I had another surgeon it would probably look better but um, you got to move fast because the longer the case the higher the probability of complications and it doesn't have to look pretty. It just has to work. But as surgeons, we always want everything to look pretty. So here she's totally decompressed. So, okay, so pause. So we're back to um, our case. So um, 
how should we approach it? Should we move it anterior? Do you think we need the posterior lateral extracavitary approach, costal trend vasectomy, or can we just do a direct posterior? Any opinions? I think lateral because it has a lot of unilateral uh, compression on the left side. You you could now you could, but I mean yes, you you're right. Uh, but I think if I, I was thinking, if I cut the lamina here, cut the lamina here, it should be fine. I mean, I don't have to get, it's not anterior. See, the, the pressure is not really anterior. It's more like this stuff here. So I think I can just get to it from a standard approach. Um, well, anyway, so this is the case. And um, can you describe, uh, M, can you describe what the case was like? You're in it, remember? What did we find? Do you remember the thoracic disc herniation? Yeah, we found <clears throat> diffuse disc material that had kind of wrapped around in, like, it was a lot more than we expected. It was a lot of disc material. And also, calcified disc material. and also the spinal cord was pushed past the midline. So you can see this is my drawing. This would have been the midline. Mm -hmm. It was all the way past the midline and compressed. And I found all the, I was like, what is this? What is going on here? There's disc material. There's a lot of disc material. And then what was interesting is after we removed it, you remember what happened? Did the spinal cord look normal afterwards? It looked a lot better. It looked better, but also it was still a little deformed, remember? Mm -hmm. Remember it didn't uh, assume a perfect shape? And as a surgeon, you're always worried like, oh no, did I get it all out? Like I want everything to look perfect. Um, but sometimes it doesn't. Like it's just been deformed there for a while. And what, let me ask somebody else another question is, if this, if this patient had this disc herniation and then this herniation happened in five seconds. Like, let's say you're in a car accident, you have a violent injury, your spine's wrenched, and a big piece of disc comes out. How would the what, how would the patient present if it happened very quickly? What would be the neurological examination if it happened very quickly like that, would you think, versus a slow process? Yeah, I mean, so if it happens acutely, very quickly, patient has a neurological, like, a, is paralyzed usually. Um, but what happened in this patient is that it was very slow. I don't know the timing, but because of that, your body accommodates to the stenosis. Same in his neck. So he's had this slow accumulation of this material over time, and probably there's a little bit just pushed him on the edge. And that's why he's still walking. So that, I mean, that's... And that's why, it, it, because it was a slow process, the spinal cord was just deformed when we were done. Thecal second. I mean, it was a lot better, but it wasn't perfect. This is my point. Um, so we did a decompression, full laminectomy, and we instrumented and we fused them. Here's post-op. And did you examine him post-op at all? And uh -huh. I believe I did. Yeah. And I, How did you do? He said immediately his leg weakness had improved yeah. after surgery. And the leg pain? Do you remember? I don't remember specifically. I just saw I just saw him a couple days ago. His leg pain's gone, which is nice. His and his leg weakness is dramatically better. I mean, he he had like it was two. He can fully extend it now, and he did not use the walker. He walked in with a cane. So yeah, it was good. It was a good result. So um, that's it. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Should. The fact that I feel like the fact that he got better quickly is a good prognostic indicator. When patients say how long, like you give him a year to get back up and get six months? Um, they ask, so how, how, like, how like, yeah, how fast does things improve? Uh, it's variable, but I think, I think, I think when patients immediately follow the surgery, if you see an improvement, that's a very good prognostic indicator. Those patients keep getting better. Um, some people, you do this surgery and nothing, no better. And you're like, oh, God. Um, sometimes it never comes back, but usually it does. And those patients are slower. But I have had cases where, like, patients were completely paralyzed. I do the surgery. Like, similar case, thoracic, lower thoracic. I did the whole surgery. Afterwards, patient's completely paralyzed, no better. And I'm really sad about it. I feel terrible. But I've had two instances where those people walk back into the office normal a year later. And I, I don't, I mean, I, I don't even recognize them because when I met them, they were like, you know, 
laying flat and sick. And it's happened to me twice in my career. It was very, very dramatic. Um, one was like a young woman at shock trauma who I had not, and she, she, and, uh, she was a very attractive woman and young, like 30. And she walked in, she said, you did my surgery. It was a big, I was like, there's no, I would definitely remember you. There's no way I, how would I? And then she said her name, I was like, oh my God, that's you. And I, 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 I thought she died. She went to rehab and she totally recovered. It was, it was like a miracle, but it took, it took a year. And I was another guy too, who, uh, that, another man, same case, but anyway. So preoperatively, when you talk with these patients, you prepare them for an entire gamut of results, all the way from this may not work to you could have a full recovery. Is you have to something like that you can see beforehand where you can sort of sort of have an idea of who's going to do better or who's going to do worse. All right. Um, yes. So, I mean, I think I think people who have a normal brain uh, cognitively right. and are healthy, mm -hmm. more likely to improve. And also people who have a social support system. So patients who have a husband or a wife or they have a family who can support them during this process, I mean, there's no science behind this, but I feel those patients always have a higher likelihood to get better. Um, but you don't know. And the other things with patients, you have to always go over every complication. There was a, what was the orthopedic surgeon? His name was uh, Rang, R-A-N-G. In his book, Taking Care of Children's Fractures, he said you have to go over every complication because the difference is if you tell somebody a possible complication that could happen, they look, and then when it happens, they look at you as like really smart, like, wow, you knew this was going to happen, and you told me, and I'm okay with it now. But if you don't tell them the possible complications, and then it happens, you look like a failure. So you have to always go over complications, possible complications with patients. And the problem is it's, it's really hard to do that as a, as a physician because it's sad and depressing, like things may not go well, and you don't want to do that. You don't want to go over negative things, but you have to. So, and as far as neurological deterioration, I mean, basically my rule of thumb is I tell people this may not work because sometimes people's injuries permanent, but I always, if I think it's going to get better, I usually say, I think you're going to get better. I just can't guarantee it. And it may take time. So that's what I say. What else? What other questions? Any other questions about thoracic disc herniations? This patient 